Empress Julia Domna, wife of Emperor Septimius Severus and mother of the turbulent emperors Geta and Caracalla, is highly recognizable because of her hair. It was naturally curly, and during her youth, extremely dense and long, probably reaching her hips, this combination of density, length, and curl is responsible for the enormous size of the chignon at the back of her head. The complex-looking interlaced pattern inscribed on the gabii chignon records a real hairstyle that is very easy to recreate using period-appropriate tools. Some Roman hairdressing tools are instantly recognizable, others may be unfamiliar. All were handmade from natural materials including wood, bone, ivory and wool, and hand-forged iron and bronze. Roman combs were made primarily of wood, few of which survive from antiquity. Others were made from ivory, bone, and even lead. Simple hair bodkins like these were used to part the hair and to hold sections of hair out of the way during styling. Hair bodkins with elaborately carved jeweled heads were used to decorate finished hairstyles. Hair bodkins were made from wood, bone, ivory, gold, silver, and set with precious stones. Wire hairpins did not exist in antiquity. Instead, ancient Roman hairstyles were held together by sewing. Hairdressers used a variety of large blunted bone or ivory needles and wool thread. Ancient scissors consisted of two knife blades connected by a U-shaped spring. Modern, X-shaped pivot-style scissors were not invented until the 12th century. Our demonstration mannequin's hair is not as long as Julia Domna's would have been, but the arrangement techniques are the same regardless. The hair is parted down the center and divided into three large sections. Sections one and two are held out of the way with hair bodkins. Begin the hairstyle in section three at the occipital. Divide the rear panel in half horizontally. Then divide the top half into three substrands. You're going to weave a three-strand inside augmenting braid toward the nape of the neck by adding small strands of hair to the center as you braid. Having reached the nape of the neck, release the two front panels. Continue braiding a simple three-strand braid all the way to the ends of the hair. It is important while you're braiding this braid to over-direct it slightly towards the right in order to assure that the bun is centered on the back of the head when you're finished. Coating the ends of the braid with a little bit of waxy pomade can help prevent the braid from unraveling. It is also helpful to run a little bit of pomade along the thread to keep it from tangling as you sew in the next step. Now it's time to make the chignon. Take a threaded bone needle and wrap the end of the thread around the end of the braid several times. Fold the end of the braid onto itself and stitch in place. This process assures that the braid will not unravel in subsequent steps. The elaborate looking interlaced pattern of this particular type of chignon is created by distorting the braid sideways and then winding it into a snail-like pattern onto itself until you reach the nape. By doing this, the center of the chignon compresses and the outer edge of the chignon expands. Continue winding the snail-shaped pattern while stitching the adjacent edges of the braid as you go until you reach the nape.
notice how solid that chignon is. Lift it onto the back of the head and secure it firmly to the head by passing the needle through the chignon and underneath the anchor braid that was created in step one. The beauty of the fat, blunt needle is that its bluntness protects the patron's scalp from being pricked or injured, and its fatness allows the hairdresser to find it as it is passed through broad masses of hair. The hairstyle is now complete. Simply snip off the thread near the chignon to remove the excess thread and the needle. The technique of hair sewing made Roman hairstyles remarkably comfortable and durable, but it was not a technique you could perform on yourself. Wealthy women such as Julia Domna had specialized hairdresser slaves called ornatrices to do their hair for them and it would seem that poor women had to have done each other's hair because there is no archaeological evidence of women's hair salons in ancient Rome.